with uh, gradual improvement. So today and perhaps tomorrow, uh, whatever I'm going to talk about should hopefully be a recap of some portions of Kubernetes. It's basically about pipelining, it's basics of pipelining. Um, and uh, and uh, keep in mind that uh, essentially we're trying to implement the instruction set that we discussed, and we'll be focusing mostly on lips. So, <clears throat> so we'll start with uh, a very simple uh, operation, um, or rather a function <coughs> in computation with a function, um, which is a cubing function. So we have to compute x cubed given x. So try to see how we can implement so the function. Yeah. So uh, we can write fx as uh, m of m, uh, where m of x y is x times y. Okay. So that's that's your uh, uh, cubing. So this decomposition of f allows us to implement f with two serially connected manifolds. Okay. So this is how it looks like. So first we apply m, and the output of it you apply m again. So this is clear? Okay. And suppose the multiplier latency is m nanosecond, then the question arises how frequently can I input, can a new input be sent to this hardware? Um, how frequently should the output be sent? Okay. So, so keep in mind that uh, this, this is a purely combinational circuit. Okay. There, is, there is no clock, nothing. You give x, after some time comes out fx. Okay. However, it is very important to realize that in real world, there is nothing that is purely combination. Because a hardware that is useful will be used repeatedly. It will be reused, and that essentially means that I give an input, I get an output fx, I'll probably give it one more input, get one more output fx, give one more input, give one more output fx, and immediately when you start doing that, these two questions become very relevant. That how fast can I reuse this machine? use this particular piece of hardware. I give x, can I give the next x in one microsecond time? Right? So that's, that's a very useful question. And um, so in this case, what is the answer to this? <coughs> 2n, right? Okay. So I give x, output comes out after 2m nanosecond. Okay. And without any difficulty, I should be able to give one more x once the previous x has already been computed. Right. So in this case, I, I should be providing inputs at a rate slower than or equal to 2m nanosecond. It's 1 per 2m nanosecond. Right. And I should be sampling my output also at the same rate. Right. So what happens if I, if I provide input at a faster rate? So suppose I give x. <coughs> And after less than 2m nanosecond, I provide the second x. What will happen? What do you think? What is going to happen? Incorrect result. Incorrect result? <coughs> so, what will be the result? Will it be something garbled? Or? It depends what are the resistance again and the time. It means the actual multiplication. So, sorry? No, so there is no register here, right? So th this is a multiplier. It takes x gives me x squared. Okay, right? And take, it takes x squared and x gives me x cubed. So I give x, and within less than two nanosecond, I give the second x. What will happen in the computation? What do you expect to see here? What do you see here? Sorry. Is it? Sorry? There is nothing garbage here. Right, so what, what value am I going to get here? Huh? No, I'm saying uh, I give x and before I, I reach 2m nanosecond, before that I give the second x. What will happen here? What value am I going to get? So it depends on when I sample here, right? Right? And how exactly, how fast, 
what the paths are through this hardware, right? How fast this, this particular line is going to get affected by this new input. Okay. So to be safe, we have to obey this particular law that for this particular circuit, I should not be providing inputs at a rate faster than 1 over 2 m gigahertz. Okay. Okay. And I should be sampling my output at the same rate. Okay. So that so the takeaway point here I'm trying to say is that there is nothing that is purely combinational in real world. There is nothing like that. Okay. There has to be a sampling rate somewhere where you provide inputs, you sample outputs. Okay. So this is what it looks like. These are some funny structures, but very important. These are called? What are, what are they called? Sorry? Sorry? Flip-flops, yeah, that's, uh, that's one way to realize this. These are usually called latches, right? Okay. Um, often they will be called pipeline registers. So I'll be using all these synonymously in this course. So uh, the function of this is that, very, very interesting. When this signal is present, it will take the value here and transfer that value to the output after some delay. Okay. So that's what it does. All right. So, um, and in this particular course, we'll be using one particular type of these. That is, um, we'll assume that the signal given here is a square wave, okay, square wave signal. And this one is going to transfer the input to the output only either on a rising edge or on a falling edge. That's called an edge triggered latch. Whenever the clock, so this is called a clock, okay? Whenever the clock edge strikes, it will take this input value here. After a, after a small delay, that will appear here. Okay, all right. And we'll also distinguish between positive edge triggered latches and negative edge triggered latches. So the ones that that uh, operate on the positive edge. So these are the positive edges. These are the negative edges. Okay, all right. So this is my uh, cubing, uh, combinational cubing circuit. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll continue to call it combinational, even though I have two latches. Okay. Separating this combinational circuit from the environment. Okay. So environment is providing me x. I'm giving out f x to the environment. All right. And I'm doing that in a combinational fashion. Frequency is uh, 0.5 over m gigahertz. That's what I'm talking about. 1 over 2m. Throughput is 1 output every 2m nanosecond. All right? Any questions so far? Okay. So one, uh, one obvious observation that we can make here is exactly one multiplier is active at any point in time. Okay. I give an input. This one computes the square. Then this goes idle. This one, this one computes the cube, and the value gets up. And then when this one computes the square, this remains idle. Okay. So why not use just one multiplier? Obvious question, right? So um, if we want to do that, we'll require some sequencing logic, and offer slightly worse throughput at almost half area cost. Okay. So let's see what that means. So um, conceptually. What we really want to do is, we'll first use this multiplier to compute the square. And we want to remember the output of that and feed it back to this. Right? That's what we roughly want to do. Okay, so first I'm showing it here in a conceptual fashion, that is by unfolding the whole thing. Okay, but, so we still have two multipliers, but I've introduced this now in the middle. Okay, so that, that, that's a pair of latches, latching x and latching x squared. Okay. And this one has to be operated faster. It has, this one has to be operated at 1 over m gigahertz. Okay. Because um, this one gets ready in m nanosecond. So I must take a clock and match it. So that in the next m nanosecond, this guy can work. Okay. All right. So the um, so frequency seen by the environment is still 0.5 over m gigahertz. All right. Throughput is 1 output every 2 m nanosecond. In reality, throughput will be actually slightly worse. Why is that? Well, we haven't gone there. I'm just talking about this one now. Okay. We have a latching between, but I still have two multipliers. So I'm, in the next slide, I'm going to fold this. Okay. But about this, I'm just talking about this one now. Why is it worse than clear? 
delay. Exactly. So there will be some delay going through these. Okay, the propagation delay of these. So what will happen is that at every m nanosecond, this clock is going to strike. Okay. So on the rising edge, I'll take whatever values here. But after only some delay, this value will appear here. Okay. So that will be taken into account when calculating the total latency of this circuit. Is it clear to everybody? Okay. As we introduce hardware, it's not coming for free. We are losing time there. Okay. So here still we, we waste half the work um, unless each multiplier is gated in alternate internal cycles. Okay. So that's one option. I can say that well, at every internal, um, every alternate internal cycle, I'll disable this multiplier if there is some way of doing that. Okay. Right. So then essentially that will go to sleep. I'll not waste any energy or power switching that multiplier. So, of course, the obvious solution is to fold them together. Okay. All right. So, let's see what that looks like. What do you do? So, um, the circuit gets a slightly more complicated. Okay. So, let's see why that is so. <coughs> so, essentially, I have brought this multiplier and put it on that. Okay. All right. So, the latch remains unchanged here. The only problem now is you have to resolve what the second input is going to be to this multiplier. One input was x, of course, right? So if you look at the second multiplier, it was still taking x as one input, but the other input was x squared. Okay, right? And if you look at this multiplier, both the inputs are x. So when you bring this here, you have to now resolve the inputs correctly. Okay. So let's see how to do that. We put a multiplexer here. Okay. So one input is x all the time. The other input switches between x square and x. And this is a toggle latch, which will keep on toggling at every cycle, okay, 0, 1, 0, 1. So whenever this goes 0, it will pick up x. Whenever this goes 1, it will pick up x square. Okay, all right? So that's the sequencing logic I was talking about. Okay. So uh, otherwise, everything else remains unchanged. The only thing that we have done here is that um, we have added some more latency in the circuit. Okay. So it's going to be even worse than the previous one. You have this latch now, and you have this multiplier now, in the critical path. This toggle latch is not exactly in the critical path, but this multiplier will be seen in the critical part of the computation. Okay. Unless, because the second input has to go through the multiplier, because before getting ready. Okay. Right. Multiplexer. Um, <coughs> so this is a multi-cycle design. Um, that's what, uh, you can call it. Okay. Um, and the reason is obvious that I have a faster clock, 1 over n gigahertz, but I take multiple cycles of that clock to compute this output. Okay. However, if you look at the environment, the environment still sees the same sampling rate. It doesn't improve, right? Because of course it should not improve. We haven't done anything smart here. We have just folded one multiplier onto the other. We're just using that multiplier twice. Okay. So the environment still sees the same sampling rate. The overall throughput will be worse than 2M because now the critical path involves this multiplexer and this latch. Um, so multi-cycle design makes sense only if there is a chance of reusing hardware so that we can save it. So keep that in mind. Otherwise, there is no point doing a multi-cycle design. Here, we could actually use one multiplier. That's why we did a multi-cycle design. So multi-cycle design will actually go through the multiplier multiple times providing the object. Otherwise, we lose in throughput, as you can see here, we lose in throughput, and increase area compared to a combinational design. So, so now if you go back to the, the one that we started with, this one, this one still gives you the best throughput actually, out of all these three options that we have evaluated till now. Okay. This will be very close to 12. Okay, all right. And what I have done gradually is that I have reduced area but I have increased my throughput. I have increased my, my latency to the circuit. Okay. So that's exactly the point I'm trying to make here, that you should be doing such an optimization only if there is a chance of winning in some department. In this case, we win in terms of area of the circuit. Okay. But we are losing in throughput compared to the combination design. So as a, as a, as a different example, suppose fx is this, g of x times x. Okay. And let's suppose latency of g is g. So before we move on to look at this particular function, any question on this? Is it clear? 
So you're saying that this this toggle latch and the multiplexer is my control unit. Yes. Okay. All right. Fine. So then uh, the entire circuit is part of uh, functional unit, or there is a division between control and function. Well, there you can make a logical division, but that's an abstraction. In reality, things will be all you know, together, sitting side by side. Okay. Depending on so the one prime primary optimization goal would be to minimize the wear length because we talked about in the first lecture that where it's slow, communication is slow, right? So where exactly this will sit, this is still very high level, okay? In the fourth floor plan, this may go somewhere else, nobody knows. Okay. Any other question on this? This multi-cycle design of the cubing function, is it clear to everybody? Okay, so let's take this one now. This is slightly different. Uh, the difference comes in the fact that um, it doesn't really use a multiplier second time. It invokes a different function, g. After using the multiplier. So this is my combinational design. My environment has to sample at the rate of 1 over n plus g gigahertz. Okay. To be correct. Okay, it should be it should be uh, it should not be faster than this sampling rate. Okay. And throughput is going to be one output every n plus g nanosecond. Alright? Okay. So now if I ask you. Should I go for a multi-cycle design with this? What do you think? This is what it looks like, right? Multi-cycle design. I have an internal clock. I have an external clock. And internally, I, I essentially latch this. Of course, I cannot fold it onto this because these two are different. Okay. So this is all I can get. So now the question is, <clears throat> what do I gain by doing this? Clearly, I don't gain anything in terms of area. I actually lose it also here because I have a, I have a late extra latch here. So do I gain it also through? So, so how do you resolve these two question marks here? Somebody? What are these frequencies? Start with the internal one. How fast should I clock this one? What are the options we have? Small f, small g, n plus g, n plus g. Any other option? So he says n plus g. Both the both places n plus g. Are you sure? But with some shift, the second block will be with some initial shift. Initial, initial shift. Gap will be there. Sorry, what? For the first block, the starting point is. Why is that needed? Because the second block M plus G cycle is different from the first block M plus G cycle. That's okay. So you are worried about the fact that the first output may be garbage. Fine. Okay. Forget about that. M plus G? Is that good to think? Why is it M plus G, this one? What is the reason? G, the G latency of G1, um, G function, and then M for, for the next input receiver. So if we go back to the previous one, internal clock was 1 over M here. It was not 1 over 2M. And this is correct, right? Is everybody convinced or are you just believing what I am saying? You can argue that, that, that this is correct. It's going to produce correct result. So yes, I could do 1 over 2m. That would still be correct. But um, that would slow down your environment. So what should I do here? What is the correct thing to do? What is the fastest clock that I can feed here? One over M. One over M. Why? Because the output 
output of the M part would be available after okay. Okay, all right. Is that enough? Do I need to worry about the other side? Whichever is the slower one, yes, okay. So this is going to be uh, 1 over max of A comma G, right? Whichever is the slower one. I have to make sure that when I sample the output of this one here, this better be free. This should not be working on something. Otherwise, I'll mess up that, uh, whatever computation is doing. All right, is this clear to everybody? The slower one. What about this one? What is the environment frequency? M plus G. M plus G? Are you sure? I sample it at 1 over max M comma G. Am I going to get an output by M plus G? How long is it going to take? Sorry? Max plus M? See, once you realize that these two, these two clocks are actually tied together, they're dependent on each other, you cannot decide them independently. You'll get the answer immediately. When you say this is 1 over max m comma g, how fast can you flop the environment? Yeah, louder. Max plus g. Does anybody see any problem with max plus g? Yeah? 1 over twice of max. So what is the problem with this uh, solution with max plus g? Exactly. So there is a chance of overwriting the computation actually. So, so this one actually has to be 1 over twice max of m plus g. Thank you comma g. So this is what it looks like. So what have, what have we gained by doing this? There is a lot of wasted work and energy. Okay, all right. Um, because half the time only one unit is working. Okay. No improvement at all over computational design. In fact, it's worse in all departments. Look at the throughput, it's going to be worse. Twice max of M plus G is going to be bigger than M plus G. Okay. Bigger than equal to M plus G. Okay, all right. Area, we are worse, we have added latches. And energy, we are probably going to be worse because of the energy consumed by the latch. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I cannot get the latch. The latch has to be worked on. Yeah. So, um, so this is a typical scenario where you should not be going to a multi-cycle design, whatever may be the case. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, now uh, moving on to pipeline. So that's the next enhancement. Okay. So multi-cycle design um, gave you age in terms of area, but you lost in terms of throughput. All right. So now if you want to pipeline it, of course, um, we'll actually put the multiplier back. We need two multipliers. Okay. All right. Because this is going to be one stage of the pipeline, and this is going to be the second stage of the pipeline. Okay. So now we actually see the environment improve. That is the final goal. I want the environment to see the improvement. This is the only case when you actually start seeing the environment improving. Okay. So now I can actually sample the input and output at a much faster rate, at 1 over n. Okay. Because what I can do is that I take the input, fit this multiplier, while this multiplier is working on the previous input. Okay. Right. And throughput is one output every m nanosecond. In reality, again, the throughput will be slightly worse because of this latch delay. So uh, the fundamental require, requirement of pipelining is that you should be able to decompose a function to be computed into a series of functions. So in other words, you should be able to express fx as such a, you know, a sequence of functions. Okay, all right. so, so in one stage, I'll do f, fkx, 
In the next stage, I'll do FK of K minus 1 of that, and so on and so forth. Okay. Ideally, one would expect a K times faster clock at K times higher K. Right. Is it clear? The basic of pipeline. Okay, right? That's how you should start. You can pipeline any computation, but the computation should be should be able to be broken down into such a form. Right. Question? Yes. So in the previous slide when we were discussing the M and G, so a combinational circuit output remains the uh, suppose that G is greater than M. Okay. And so we are talking at uh, one upon G. Okay. So and then the M uh, the multiplier latency is M cycle, so it is smaller than G. Okay. So the output would uh, the combinational circuit for M will keep on outputting the same. Yes, it will. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, it will keep on computing the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. All right. But yeah, so so as long as you sample at one over two G, uh, I mean you're still going to get the correct result. So anything else you do will make it incorrect. Any question? Pipeline. Okay. All right. So uh, going back to the, pre the other one, um, how do you pipeline this one? So here, um, this is how you pipeline this computation, and your your environment will also see the improvement immediately. It will be one over max in homology. So that's a that's a definite improvement over computational circuit, which was seeing a throughput of m plus g. Max m homology is going to be less than or equal to m plus g. All right. Um, so frequency is 1 over max m comma g gigahertz, throughput is 1 output every max m comma g nanosecond, and again in reality throughput will be slightly worse, but still better than the combination of implementation. Okay, that's the whole point. So pipelining, um, if done well, should always bring benefit over combination of implementation in terms of throughput. Um, we are not commenting anything on area because in most cases, we will actually end up increasing the area. Because you have to introduce latches and all other things. Any question? All right. So now um, let's uh, go a little deeper into pipeline. Imagine feeding a series of inputs x to a k-stage pipeline implementation of some computation f x. So usually one would expect the computation on two inputs to be independent of each other. We feed x1, the pipeline takes up x1, computes at x1, and next I give x2, pipeline computes at x2, x1, so on, x3 and x3. So usually one would expect that the computation of two inputs would be independent of each other. This is true for very some 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 class of functions which are called stateless or memoryless functions. That is when you are computing f of x1, whatever states you produce, you forget them. Okay. And that doesn't influence your computation of f of x2. All right. So these are called stateless or memoryless functions. Consider the following function with a global state r. So now we'll start talking about functions which are state holding. Okay. And let's see how pipeline gets complicated when you bring in such things. So here is the function definition. fx returns y. And what does fx do? If r equal to 0, so there is a global state r. Okay. If r is 0, then it computes y equal to x cube. Else, it computes y equal to 3x. So it either multiplies 3, three values or adds 3 values. Okay, all right. And finally, updates r equal to y mod 3. All right. So now, what do you think? I feed x1. What I do for x2 is not really known until I finish computing f of x1. So how to pipeline this function? So we'll assume that we have two multipliers and two adders. Um, computation of one input depends on the previous one. That's pretty obvious, right? Because the value of r is going to change. Okay. So these are called pipeline hazards. That is now, the two inputs cannot be computed independently. I cannot compute a particular value ignoring the, 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 the history of the pipeline. Okay, that's impossible. So let's see how to pipeline this one. 
So first we'll start as usual with a combinational representation of f. So um, so this one computes x squared, this one computes 2x, this one computes x cubed, this one computes 3x, then I take r, fit it to a multiplexer, select based on r, which one I should go, I should do, and then apply this one to a mod 3 block, okay, all right, to update r, and this one is my output y. Clear to everybody? Okay. So what's the latency of this? This latency is going to be two of twice max m comma a. So these two are going to be concurrent, all right? Plus the multiplexer latency, plus the modulo latency. Now there's a question here. Should I include this one to my latency or not? Because my output is actually ready at this point. That's why, that the environment gets out. What do you think? Should the modulo class be inside my latency or not? And the latency is going to decide at what rate my input and output will be sampled, actually. It should be. It should be, why? Because our answer depends on R. Okay. So if R is delayed, the previous answer might be calculated and... Exactly, exactly right. So I, well, but remember that I am using R much later. Okay, but of course, my modulo function may be so slow the next input comes in, finishes computation and at the multiplexer, I haven't yet updated R. That may be possible actually. Okay. So it is always safe to include this in my latency. Alright. So it determines the throughput and I/O sampling rate. Um, so as you can see here, there is a lot of wasted work because you know I'll be either taking this one or taking this one, right? But I'm computing both. Okay. But I've done it in this way because it's somewhat easy to find out. Okay. Um, otherwise, what you could do is you could get m or a based on the value of r that is disable, whichever path you want to disable, and you could move the multiplexer to front. Okay. And actually select which path to take. Right. But that becomes very, very difficult to find out. We'll see this particular exactly this case when piping your pipeline in your processor. Okay. Because here the fundamental problem is that. When x comes in, we don't know which way to go. We don't know whether we should take this path or we should take this path. All right? Until and unless we know the value of r. Okay. So we'll stick to this particular design. We'll waste a lot of hardware, but this is easier to find. Any question on this? Okay. All right. So let's see. First option, let's suppose we want a two-stage pipeline. So you put a pipeline latch here. Okay. So first question that you have to answer whenever you try to pipeline something is does it produce a correct result? Forget about performance. That's the first question. What do you think? How do you analyze this particular circuit? What kind of Yeah? Are you thinking? Okay, I assume that you'll think in future. So I'll tell you the answer. Yes, it does. Because um, this one computes your x square and 2x. That passes on to the next stage. And I'll take in the next input here, all right? Um, and there is no problem as such. The only question was about R, but there is no issue with R because if you notice, I am clocking R with the with the same clock, right? So, so this one gets modified only after I read out my output, right? Because the same clock. So the R value that we fed in the multiplexer is the value that, that, the, that the latch had when the computation started. Okay. So there is no problem with this. Right? What about performance? How good is this pipeline? Okay. What is the clock rate of, the, of this pipeline? How fast can I run this pipeline? Which stage is going to determine the pipeline frequency, you think? This one, right? 
Why is that? And M is common and you have something more extra here. So this is going to be the slower state. So as we have already seen, we should take the max of 2, right? Okay. So that means, uh, so these are often called unbalanced pipelines. Okay. So we have two states which are not balanced. And that means there is a chance of improving. Because I, I should be able, if I can balance them, I must be able to gain in clock frequency, right? Okay. Because the slower, the slower state is going to come in my clock frequency. <clears throat> so I make it a three-stage pipeline. So um, again, the same question you have to ask, is it correct? That is still correct because as I just mentioned, the value of R that that particular value of X is going to use is going to be correct. Okay, right? So because R is modified only here and the value read out will be before that. Okay, all right. So, um, but you have to be a little careful here. That is, you are you're reading from and writing to the same register in the same pipe stage. Okay. Right? Um, that was true even for the previous one. Right? So, we were writing to this particular register and reading from this register in the same pipe stage. Okay, right? So, um, if you want to see what happens exactly, so let's call this S1 and S2. Okay. Two states, all right? So time goes in this direction. Okay. So for a particular value of x, let's say x1. x1 observes s1 and then s2, all right? x2 starts here. So when x1 is doing s2, x2 will be s1. And then it does S2 here. Okay. So there is a problem because the value of R that S1 is going to use here has already been modified. Okay. Right? Does everybody see that? Okay. So because um, what really is going to happen is that um, if you okay. This is where x1 gets sampled. Okay. This is where this latch will be sampled. Okay. This is where the R value will be updated. Right? Okay. And this is exactly where X2's S2 will start executing. What about performance? Did we improve upon the previous pipeline? What is the what is the expected uh, throughput of or the clock frequency? Who determines the clock frequency of this pipe? Max. Mm. Max of all three, right? Mm. Which is definitely going to be better than the previous one. Okay, because the longest one uh, in the previous case has been broken down to two now. Okay, right? And um, if all the algorithms are same, you can expect that either this or this will be the determining stage. Okay. Because this is going to be a very fast stage, doing a mod 3 operation and a multiplexing. Okay. Right. Suppose I had a mod 3 implemented as a divider, possible actually. Okay. That's going to be very, very, very slow. So you say that, well, let me isolate that. Okay. Is this correct? Are we good yet? Or there is some problem with this one. See, there's a comment here. It says the back edge crosses a pipeline latch. Why is it important? What is the problem? He says that there is some problem with the R value. What is the problem? Can you explain it more? Uh, it might be the case mod 3 is faster. It there is a might be case here. I tell you that it's wrong under all conditions. Mm -hmm. 
value of R is being produced in the next future cycle and then trying to use it in R. So if you try to do this again for this pipeline, We have S1, S2, S3, S4, X1, X2, so I need the value of R at S3 stage, right, okay. So X2 needs this value here, the value is latched here after S4, so there is no way to get the right value. So x2 is actually going to get the value of x0, the previous one, previous one. Okay. So keep this in mind, whenever you see that in your design, a value is getting produced in a stage which comes after the stage that consumes the value, you know that there is a problem. Okay. This pipeline is not going to work. Okay, all right? <clears throat> And that essentially translates to a backage crossing a pipeline latch in a parent diagram. <clears throat> so, um, so these are called uh, pipeline hazards. Um, and um, resolving this one is not going to be easy. There's no, no easy way to resolve this. Okay. You need a value here which is latched here. Okay. Which is in fact which stabilizes at the end of S4. Mm -hmm. I need the value at the beginning of S3. There's no easy solution. Okay. <clears throat> so here is another hazard of slightly different nature. So in that particular hazard, the problem was that given x, we did not know what to do with this x, which way to go. Okay. And which way to go depends on the composition of the previous x. Okay. Here, we know what to do but we may not have the data ready to do that. Okay. So here, you know, here's a function, uh, defines uh, fx returns y, where y is x squared times r, and r is y mod 3. So here the nature of computation is known, but the required data may not be available. Okay. So when you, when you try to pipeline, you realize that. Another similar example, <coughs> where we make it x times r squared, as opposed to x squared times r. All right. And r is again y mod 3. So let's see how to pipeline these two. So this is um, y is x squared times r. So again, we start with the combinational circuit. Okay. So we have two multipliers. Take the input from r in the second multiplier. And the remaining things are same. Right. <coughs> latency is 2m plus modulo. <coughs> modulo latency. That determines your throughput and your sample rate. So I put the pipeline latch there. Are we good? Yes, we are good. There is a problem there. Um, R is consumed and produced, sorry, yes. produced and consumed in the same pipe stage. So we should be fine. Are we good? No, we are not. Right? So here we have a backage crossing this. And if you look at what's actually happening, R is essentially not ready when you need it. The data is not ready. Right. So here's the hazard rule. Keep this in mind. Source stage of a data comes after the restoration stage. That creates major problem in the pipelines. And there is no easy solution that can win back the lost performance because of this. So the only solution is that you have to wait for one cycle. So in general, you have to wait for number of cycles equal to distance between the source stage and the restoration stage. Okay. All right. So in this case, the distance is one. If you, if you stall this particular stage, for one cycle, you will get the correct value. Right? <coughs> the other one, x times r square. So here, you can easily see the problem, right? R has far-reaching influence. It goes to the even first stage, actually. You need from the very beginning of the computation. Okay. Right? So latency is same, 2m, 2m plus mod. Um, so when I try to pipeline it, there is a problem. 
right? Okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so sorry. So this is okay, right? With everybody, okay. So we have the same problem here. We have a we have a hazard. So this is a somewhat easier to pipeline uh, computation. So we keep x equal to x into r square, but we change r to be equal to x mod instead of y mod. Okay, all right. So I can compute r first. Okay, but remember that the computation of one x still depends on the previous computation because the r value comes from the previous x. Actually, it is not this r that we are using in the computation. Okay, all right. So there is still a dependence that remains on the previous computation. So can we pipeline? And the answer is yes. Let's see how to do it. So this is my um, combinational circuit. I bring the mod block here, right? Okay. I take x, produce r, all right? Everything else is unchanged. And now my delay becomes uh, max of 2m comma mod, right? Because I can run this one in parallel with these two. Okay. <coughs> So I put a latch there. Are you good? Yes? yes. Why? Yes. How can I, how can it be? I mean I I what value of R am I using? I can logically drag it here, right? That's what he's suggesting. So if you look at it. The latch also crosses a forward edge here. Okay, all right. So that means what I can do is, when this cycle finishes, I can latch the value of R, so that the next cycle can take the value of R from here. Okay, all right. That's called a bypass path. So um, if the source stage of data comes before or equal to the destination stage, even if the data is written to storage element in a later stage, we are fine, can be handled with the bypass path. So in this case, this is a stage that is producing the value. That's written after a long time, but the value is here actually, ready for you to consume. So if the destination stage is equal to this or before this, we are okay, we can handle that without any problem. Okay. All right? Is it clear to everybody? Okay, resolving hazard with bypass. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Um, we have covered pretty much all the cases of pipelining that you see when you try to pipeline a processor. So believe me, pipelining a processor is orders of magnitude more difficult than pipelining these simple computations. So we'll see the problems. Um, before we go into that, I'll spend a few minutes next lecture trying to explain how to simulate a pipeline. Because um, as we discussed in the first lecture, in a computer design cycle, you usually start with simulations before you finalize the design, before it goes to the country for design. So you have to understand how to simulate a pipeline. It may seem very trivial that why should it be any difficult? So we'll talk about that for a few minutes next class, and then we'll take up pipeline your next class. Okay.